Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Later by Stephen King. So this is his newest novel, Only the Dead Have No Secrets. This is one of the hard case crime books. Dane reads. Uh, he's been doing a lot more crime stuff uh, recently, I, I find. Uh, I was chatting to Duncan Ralston, who's an indie horror writer, on uh, Twitter, and he asked me if I thought this was a trunk novel. If it was a trunk novel, which is the name that King uses for books that he kind of puts aside and then comes back to, he has at least kind of updated it to make it fit in with our modern times. Uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb here, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts on racing at the end. So, sometimes growing up means facing your demons. The son of a struggling single mother, Jamie Conklin just wants an ordinary childhood. But Jamie is no ordinary child. Born with an unnatural ability, his mom urges him to keep secret. Jamie can see what no one else can see and learn what no one else can learn. But the cost of using this ability is higher than Jamie can imagine. As he discovers when an NYPD detective draws him into the pursuit of a killer who has threatened to strike from beyond the grave. Later is Stephen King at his finest, a terrifying and touching story of innocence lost and the trials that test our sense of right and wrong. With echoes of King's classic novel, It, Later is a powerful, haunting, unforgettable exploration of what it takes to stand up to evil in all the faces it wears. No, no, it doesn't really have echoes of it. It does, in a way, have echoes of uh, Chew, which is a graphic novel series by John Lehman and Robert Guillory, or something like that. Because um, in Chew, basically, the protagonist is a detective, and he can he gets like psychic impressions from food. So he goes to like crime scenes and takes a bite out of the cadavers and can tell how they died and stuff. So in this, the the, um, the kid can like see people after they've died essentially. So it's also a bit like whatever it was, the sixth sense. And um, so the, the main character is mum and she's a literary agent for a guy called Regis Thomas um, who pays their rent, he, he like writes a lot of books. And this is kind of echoes of the criticism that um, King himself receives. Uh, so that he goes, is it about Roanoke? Do we even have to ask Jamie? Which made me snicker. Everything good old Regis wrote was about Roanoke. That was the burden he toted in life. A bit like everything that King writes is about Maine. So here we have, uh, I'm going to read this out. So yeah, I see dead people. As far as I can remember, I always have. But it's not like in that movie with Bruce Willis. It can be interesting, it can be scary sometimes, the Central Park dude. It can be a pain in the ass, but mostly it just is. Like being left-handed or being able to play classical music when you're like three years old. Or getting early onset Alzheimer's, which is what happened to Uncle Harry when he was only 42. At age six, 42 seemed old to me. But even then I understood it's young to wind up not knowing who you are or what the names of things are. For some reason, that's what always scared me the most when we went to see Uncle Harry. His thoughts didn't drown in blood from a busted brain vessel, but they drowned just the same. Yeah, Alzheimer's and dementia are evil diseases. Awful, awful. My mum used to work on an elderly care ward and like patients would attack her because they didn't realise where they were, they didn't understand that she was a nurse and they'd like, so she'd come home with like a black eye being like some old man punched me today. And obviously it's not their fault. We get a reference to them watching an episode of Torchwood, which is like a Doctor Who spin-off. I don't know if they're still making new episodes of that. I don't think they are. So maybe that does date it and put it as a trunk novel, because I think Torchwood was... I mean, it was at the height of its popularity, I guess, when I was about 18, something like that. Uh, we get this. I started to cry again. My mother hugged me and rocked me, and I went to sleep while she was doing it. I tell you what, there's nothing like having a mother around when you're thinking of scary shit. Yeah, I ring my mum sometimes when I'm having panic attacks, being like, Mom, talk me down, please. And we get a reference to the Croatoan mystery. There's plenty of YouTube videos on that, but basically, I think it was in... I think, yeah, it was in Roanoke. And um, uh, some settlers disappeared, and all that was left behind was the word carved into a tree or a rock or something. Um, and the mystery's never really been solved. But also, this has got, like, a bit of, I guess, a reference to uh, our woke, woke, modern woke culture. So I'm going to read these uh, couple of paragraphs out, because they're pretty interesting. And this is about the, uh, what's his name, um, Regis or whatever, his uh, book series. The books really were a saga in that they told one continuing story with a cast of continuing characters. They were strong men with fair hair and laughing eyes, untrustworthy men with shifty eyes, noble Indians, who in later books became noble Native Americans, and gorgeous women with firm high breasts. Everyone, the good, the bad, the firm breasted, was Randy all the time. The heart of the series, what kept the readers coming back, other than the jewels, murders and sex that is, was the titanic secret that had caused all the Roanoke settlers to disappear. Had it been the fault of George Threadgill, the chief villain? Were the settlers dead? Was there really an ancient city beneath Roanoke full of ancient wisdom? What did Martin Betancourt mean when he said, time is the key, before expiring? What did that cryptic word Croatoan, found carved on a palisade of the abandoned community, really mean? Millions of readers slaver to know the answers to these questions. To anyone far in the future finding that hard to believe, I'd simply tell you to hunt up something by Judith Krantz or Harold Robbins. Millions of people read their stuff too. But then Regis dies and so his mum 
basically tasks the kid with finding out all the details of his unpublished final novel so that she can write it so that they can get some money in because they're really struggling for it. So he's talking to the dead guy here um, and we get, I was curious about the sash he was wearing, had been wearing when he died. I was at my desk, he said. I always wear my sash when I'm writing. It's my good luck charm. What's the blue ribbon for? The regional spelling bee I won when I was in the sixth grade. Spelled down kids from 20 other schools. I lost in the state competition, but I got this blue ribbon for the regional. My mother made the sash and pinned the ribbon on it. In my opinion, I thought that was sort of a weird thing to still be wearing, since sixth grade must have been a zillion years ago for Mr. Thomas. But he said it without any embarrassment or self-consciousness. Some dead people can feel love. Remember me telling you about Mrs. Burkett kissing Mr. Burkett's cheek? And they can feel hate, something I found out in due time. But most of the other emotions seem to leave when they die. Even the love never seemed all that strong to me. I don't like to tell you this, but hate stays stronger and lasts longer. I think when people see ghosts, as opposed to dead people, it's because they're hateful. People think ghosts are scary because they are. And uh, here we have like some references to the old school um, nursery rhymes and fairy tales and all, all that stuff that used to be a lot more brutal back in the day than uh, like the versions we're used to now. In the original, the wicked stepsisters cut off their toes in their efforts to make the glass slipper fit. Ew, I said this in a way that meant gross, tell me more. And the glass slipper wasn't glass at all, Jamie. That seems to have been a translation error which has been immortalized by Walt Disney, that homogenizer of fairy tales. The slipper was actually made of squirrel fur. Wow, I said. Not as interesting as the stepsisters cutting off their toes, but I wanted to keep him rolling. In the original story of the Frog King, the princess doesn't kiss the frog. Instead, she... No more, Mum said. Let him read the stories and find out for himself. Always best, Mr. Burkett agreed. And perhaps we'll discuss them, Jamie. You mean you'll discuss them while I listen, I thought. But that would be okay. His mum's like seeing a, a woman, basically, and I just want to read these three paragraphs out because these are quite pertinent to our times. Before that, Liz and my mother used to have what mum called spirited discussions, mostly about books. They liked many of the same writers, they bonded over Regis Thomas, remember, and the same movies. But Liz thought my mother was too focused on things like sales and advances and various writers' track records instead of the stories. And she actually laughed at the works of a couple of mum's clients, calling them subliterate. To which my mother responded that those subliterate writers paid the rent and kept the lights on, kept them lit. Not to mention paying for the care home where Uncle Harry was marinating in his own pee. Then the arguments began to move away from the more or less safe ground of books and films and got more heated. Some were about politics. Liz loved this Congress guy, John Burner. My mother called him John Boner, which is what some kids of my acquaintance called a stiffy. Or maybe she meant to pull a boner, but I don't really think so. Mom thought Nancy Pelosi, another politician who you probably know as she's still around, was a brave woman working in a boys club. Liz thought she was your basic liberal dingleberry. The biggest fight they ever had about politics was when Liz said she didn't completely believe Obama had been born in America. Mom called her stupid and racist. They were in the bedroom with the door shut. That was where most of their arguments happened. But their voices were raised and I could hear every word from the living room. A few minutes later, Liz left, slamming the door on her way out and didn't come back for almost a week. When she did, they made up in the bedroom with the door closed. I heard that too because the making gut part was pretty noisy groans and laughter and squeaky bed springs. And so uh, basically then uh, the main character's mom writes this uh, this like final unpublished manuscript and passes it off as Regis's. And there we go. Once the book was finally turned in, mom spent a week pacing and snapping at everyone. I was not excluded from said snappery. Waiting for Fiona to call and say, Regis didn't write this book. It doesn't sound a bit like him. I think you wrote it to you. But in the end, it was fine. Either Fiona never guessed or didn't care. Certainly the reviewers never guessed when the book was crashed into production and appeared in the fall of 2010. Publishers Weekly, Thomas saved the best for last. Kirkus Reviews, fans of sweet savage historical fiction will once more be in bodice ripping clover. Dwight Garner in the New York Times, the trudging flavourless prose is typical Thomas, the rough equivalent of a heaping plate of food from an all-you-can-eat buffet in a dubious roadside restaurant. And uh, here we get a very short section, so I'm just going to read out the full bit here. While we were eating our ice cream at Lickety Split, Liz phoned my mother to tell her where we were and what we were up to. Liz said, it must be so strange what you can do, so weird. Doesn't it freak you out? I thought of asking her if it freaked her out to look up at night and see the stars and know they go on forever and ever, but didn't bother. I just said no. You get used to marvellous things, you take them for granted. You can try not to, but you do. There's too much wonder, that's all. It's everywhere. And we get this just a little throwaway. To a kid who grew up in the Palace on Park, it looked more like that Shawshank Redemption prison than an apartment building. And obviously King wrote uh, the Shawshank Redemption, Rita Hayworth and the Shaw Shawshank Redemption. I think it was part of different seasons. And his mother's uh, girlfriend basically kind of kidnaps him and forces him to do what she wants. Um, but she's also got a cocaine addict, so we get, Your nose is bleeding again, I said. She wiped it with the heel of her palm, then wiped it on her sweatshirt. 
Not for the first time by the look of it. Septum's gone, she said. I'm gonna fix it once I'm clean. And then we get this as well. Um, we were a little over an hour away from our final destination and just thinking that gave me the creeps. Final destination being a particularly gory horror movie me and my friends had watched. Not up there with the saw flicks, but still pretty fucking grim. I find Final Destination much scarier than the, the Saw films though. The Saw films are just gore fest, whereas Final Destination kind of preys on your mind. And again we get, because you were a transporter like in that Jason Statham movie, great movie. But again all of these little pop culture references are just a lot of fun to, to sort of to spot. And then um, after this, which I think is very typical of what people would do and how they'd react if like a horrible situation happened, you know. One of the advantages was not having to run a gauntlet of reporters and TV cameras at the inquest because I didn't have to testify in person. I gave a video deposition instead with a lawyer Monty Grisham found for me on one side and my mum on the other. The press knew who I was but my name never appeared in the media because I was that magic thing, a minor. The kids at school found out, the kids at school almost always found out everything, but nobody ragged on me. I got respect instead. I didn't have to figure out how to talk to girls because they came up to my locker and talked to me. And now we get the line, books are a uniquely portable magic, I read that somewhere. That's a Stephen King quote as well. It's kind of weird that he quotes himself, but hey ho. So overall, Later by Stephen King. I thought it was okay. It's definitely better than like If It Bleeds, which I didn't think so much of, but it's not as good as some of his other more recent stuff like The Institute or even like 112263, which is just phenomenal. But overall, I did still enjoy it. I gave it a four out of five and would recommend, especially to Stephen King fans and crime fans and people who like ghosties and stuff. Uh, I'm not going to cover like the main, there's a bad guy in this that isn't just his mum's girlfriend as well, a uh, bad dead guy basically, but in typical Stephen King style, it's one of those things where it's hard to explain exactly what's going on if you haven't read the book because it just builds over time until you accept it in the same way that, you know, Pennywise doesn't, you know, the true extent of Pennywise you only really appreciate once you've read it, you know. But yeah, later by Stephen King. So as always, let me know what you thought of this book if you read it in the comments. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.